This is Mark Guerrero in Palm Springs, California here. It's July 2nd, 1998, and I'm sitting here about to interview Mr. Don Tosti, or as your real name is... Edmundo Martinez Tostado. And uh, Tostado, obviously you are uh, of uh, Mexican heritage. That's right. Your, your parents were born in Mexico? My parents, no, they were born here in this country. But Their parents were? Yeah. My mother was born in El Paso, Texas. My father was born in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And what about your, their parents? Were their parents are from uh, Villa Humada, where the tribe is Tarumaras. Oh, yeah. From Villa Humada. That's where we come from. On both grandparents on both sides from the yes. same region? Wow. Yeah. And um, the Toasty was a nickname, right? Obviously. For yeah, well, they didn't like Martinez Tostado. They, it sounded too uh, ethnic. Well, and then, and at that time, you know, they changed Vicky Carr's name. They right. changed uh, Richie Valenzuela, Ricardo Valenzuela. So. Did they do that? Was it a conscious thing? Well, let's call you Toasty, or were people calling you that anyway? Well, they called me, yeah, in high school, you know, everybody called me Toasty, because Tostados means right. toasted. <laughs> I did. Yeah. But they didn't spell it T-O-A-S-T. They used to Why, spell toasty. it T-O-A-S-T-I-E. Well, they did. I said bullshit. If you're going to spell it, you're going to call me Tosti, you spell it like the Italian composer, Tosti. Oh, and there was one, huh? Yeah, Paolo Tosti. Oh, wow. World renowned. And uh, there's also that Tosti, uh, what is it, wine or champagne? Oh, yeah. Astis Pumonti. Very wealthy Italian. Okay, so, so that's just so name then, say, So then people just called you Toasty, and then it. at some point you just decided to use it as a professional name, or, or they... No, no, when I was in high school, they didn't want to put down that Mundo Martin Sostano in orchestra, so they put... Don Tosti, Sir Tosti. Mm. Don like Don Eduardo. Right. Don Marco, Don Edmundo. Did you have a problem with it or were you okay? No. Nah, that? that didn't matter to me. I was a young kid. I was only 14, 15. So. Okay. So let's go back to the beginning. You, okay. you were born and grew up in what cities in Texas? Yeah, El Paso, Texas. I was born March 27th, 1923. And grew up in El Paso? I grew up there till 1939 when I came to high school in Los Angeles. I see. Now, again, as far as your musical life, was the beginning your grandfather with the piano lessons, or what was the, the beginning? Well, the beginning was at the age of seven. I got into a lot of mischief, and they got me a gentleman named, oh my heavens, Rayo Reyes and Pioquinto Gonzalez, two great musicians, and they would teach me, and I had to do two hours every day from the time I was seven on every day, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. And at the time, you resented it? Well, at the time, they beat the pie out of me. I had to do it. <laughs> it's called discipline. <laughs> beat the pie out of you. Yeah, with a belt. No sin and so the whole purpose of the music lessons was just to keep you out of trouble. Keep me out of mischief, yeah. And so you were not really excited about it. You well, no, I was, I was seven. You know, I, yeah. I did what I was told. Yeah, you'd rather be out playing or something. That's why. So your grandfather is the one who engineered this whole conspiracy? Yes, the grandfather and <coughs> grandmother and two and. Did you start on piano? No. You started violin? Violin. Okay. And the first thing I studied was solfeo. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, to, si, la, sol, pa, mi, ra, do. That's called solfege. Right. That's a European and Hispanic way of teaching music. And at what point did you actually start to enjoy it if you did? Oh, by the time I was nine and ten, I was with the symphony, and I would be presented in recitals for social clubs, lady social clubs, and they would give me money and bicycles and toys. And then you liked it? Yeah, I says, hell. I was the only guy in the neighborhood with a bicycle, so. And uh, as far as the symphony, you could go back here. How in the world did, obviously you got very good very fast, but how does a nine-year-old wind up in an adult symphony orchestra? By practicing two, three hours a day. Anybody can do it. Okay. Anybody. Uh, if you practice two, three hours and you have a good <laughs> teacher, then you'll do it. That's no, nothing. And so uh, who decided to take you down to audition or whatever? To the Pinto Gonzalez, a great Mexican composer took me to the symphony and presented me to H. Arthur Brown, who was the conductor of the El Paso Symphony, for an audition. I played for him. I could read anything. And at first, was he stunned that such a little kid came? Well, yeah. Was I was the only kid in the... Everybody, everybody was professional except me, but 
I scared them and I could play, I could read, I could play, so like, they kept me. Wow, and how long did you play for them? Well, I, from the 10 till I was about 14, 15 when I came to California. And did you did you guys travel or did you always just play in El no, Paso? No, it's El Paso Symphony. Wow, that had to be a great experience. And meanwhile, you just stayed on violin, you didn't take I up stayed on violin. I, I took piano for harmony and then my I got my hands cut up, so I stopped playing piano. And I played violin. And then, then you came to Los Angeles for what reason? How'd that happen? Uh, chasing a girl. Oh, really? How, yeah. how old were you? 14. Didn't you go with your parents or your, your... Well, my mother lived in Los Angeles. And I was brought up by her sisters who adopted me. And when this girlfriend, uh, they sent her away one summer to L.A. to get her away from me because she came from a very fine Mexican family. And I was very humble, very poor, educated, but poor, and they didn't like that. So I came to L.A., following the girl. Talk we about met, fate, yeah. huh? And then I went home. We went home again. This time I didn't like El Paso. And uh, the father of this young lady made things difficult for me there. He was influential and wealthy, so <laughs> he made it rough for me. So I Was this lady, uh, uh, the girl, was she Latina or was she? Latina? Yes. Mexican girl, but Angloish looking. Her name was Socorro Wright. She came from a very fine Mexican family, wealthy. They hated the poor, you know, two distinctions. Mm. And so they didn't care that you were with the symphony, it was still you were lower class or whatever. That's right. Jeez. So you said you went to LA for a while, then you came back to El Paso, but you didn't like it, and then you no, went back to LA without her? Right yeah, there. oh yeah. I mean, you know, we were 13, 14, 15. I came to L.A. and I went to public school there. And I became the concertmaster of the All-National Symphony Orchestra, high school symphony. Because I was, you know, I was a fine violinist. I, I, I studied and I played. So what age did you come back to L.A. You know, the second time, permanently? Well, 15. You were 15. You yeah. lived with your mom at that point? Yes, I lived with my mother. My mother had remarried and she had married very well, so I lived at her home. Now, did, did your father pass away young or what was No, I was, I was born out of a love affair. Mm -hmm. um, did you know who he was? No, not until 1948. And how'd you find out? I met him in Oakland, California. I kept looking for my father because I wanted to see where the world I came from. And What'd you think of him? Well, he was, turned out to be a good man. He was a naval officer. He was... Uh, promoter, a radio announcer, an orchestra leader. He was everything. Oh. He didn't know how to do anything, but he was a promoter. There are such things. Look around you. I know. Did you get a, uh, uh, start up a relationship with him after that, or you just saw him occasionally? No, we, I met him in 48, and I was with Les Brown then. We did a concert at the University of California at Berkeley. And when I found him, I went to his home. He said I had a half brother and a half sister, or half Italian, and they took me to their home. And he asked me what in the world I was doing working for Les Brown. Why did he say that? I don't know. <laughs> he thought that was second rate. He wasn't impressed by that. Huh? No. Holy. He shit. said that I should be an orchestra leader or a writer. I says, well, I'm an orchestrator. I can orchestrate and arrange. I've studied that, and I write for the big bands. He said, no, 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 I mean a composer. So I said, well, I never thought of composing. So he's the guy who instigated my writing. Okay. Yeah, he's a guy. So first thing that I ever wrote was a bolero called Vine Por Ti, which recorded by Ruben Reyes, and the world knows about that. Wow. That was in 48 came with the biggest Latin hit there was. Then I followed it with a thing called Pachuca Boogie. Oh, really? And that's in the Smithsonian Institute. That was in 1948. Was that with uh, Ericano? Ericano on piano, Raul Diaz did the vocals, and uh, Bob Hernandez was a tenor man, very gifted. We were kids, you know, but they were great musicians. Wow, and Ericano went on to his own fame. Right? Oh, yeah. It's amazing. I met Eddie Cano when I came back from New York, and he studied harmony with me. And he went on, you know, like in the book, he gets a whole chapter. Uh, which book is that? Uh, 
Uh, Audio rhythms? That's right. That's right. He got the whole chapter. It's amazing. He studied with me. When did you switch over to upright bass from violin? How'd that happen? In 1941. How'd that happen? Well, the war started. The Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. And all the Mexican kids in the East Side wanted to be Marines on the kind of the uniform for the girls. And I went and I wanted to be a Marine. They found a spot in my lung. So they took away my tenor saxophone, my clarinet, and I couldn't do very much with my violin. The symphony didn't want me. The studios didn't want me. I was a brown kid. I was a Mexican. They didn't want the Mexican kids to show off all the white kids. So I was starving. So. I stayed home to cure that spot in my lung, and I studied bass. I studied bass from 41 to 43. In 43, I ended up in New York with Jack D. Gordon. Amazing. Now tell me that wonderful what? story of uh, how you got that first job. You were at L.A. State or something? Yeah, I was going to L.A. City College from Vermont. The people who adopted me wanted me to be an accountant. So I studied accountancy and bookkeeping. and. Uh, one day I went to hear the band. They had a real great jazz band at the college, and the bass player didn't show up. So Bob Fowler, the great trumpet player, told the teacher that there's Stosi, he's a good bass player. So they asked me to sit in if I could read and play. I said, yeah. So I sat in, and in the back, in the studios in the back, Jack T. Garden was recording what we called an armed forces transcription, which was a recording for the armed forces for the army. And when they got through recording, they came out and they heard us play. The next thing I know, Frank Harrington, Jack T. Gard's manager, was offering me a job as a bass player. Jesus. I'm only 19 years old. Yeah. And that was the thing, as I recall, you went home and asked your mom, and she said no. And she did want you. I had to finish my schooling. So, like, uh, they offered me a 200 a week in 1943. Oh, yeah. So when they called me, I told, Frank Harrington called me, and I said, I can't go to New York with you. He says, why? So he says, because my mother says, I have to finish my schooling. So he says, well, how old are you, Toasty? I said, 19. And he said, do you still do what your mother says? Oh, that's true. And I said, yes, I'm adopted. And they educated me, and I loved them, and that's it. So in the background, Jack T. Garden told Frank, offer the kid 50 bucks more. When they offered, me 250 a week, I went to New York. Even though your mom still didn't want you to? Yeah. And what was that like, uh, that first uh, trip to New York? You played with Beautiful. Jack T. Garden? Jack T. Garden, I went with him. Was he was a trombonist? Or jazz trombonist, world renowned. Anybody who knows anything about jazz music knows And, music. and how long uh, did you play with him? Ah, uh, let's see, 43, 45, a couple of years. Then I went with Bobby Sherwood, who was then a great band. From there, and I think I went with Bobby Sherwood, I think I went with uh, Charlie Barnett, I think. From then on, I get offers for more money, so I go. I went to Les Brown. I was with Jimmy Dorsey in 48 when I married my Mexican wife, and he was my best man. Wow. So, uh, that's one of the things, you know, if you read, if you study history, how many Mexican-Americans played in the big bands in the 40s. Research that, it's interesting. How many, not many? Two? Oh, that I know of. Uh, that was Ernie Cáceres with Glenn Miller. Ernie Figueroa was with Jimmy Dorsey and Don Tosti. And what did those other two gentlemen play? When it's oh, well, Ernie Cáceres was the baritonist with... Uh, Glenn Miller. Baritone sax? Baritone sax. He was with him all the time. When we, when we If you listen to Glenn Miller's uh, Jingle Bells, there's a guy who sings, Down in Mexico, we ain't got no snow, we ain't got no snow, down in Mexico, that's Ernie Cáceres. <laughs> he was my idol, because I was a saxophonist student then, you know. And it's funny, I met him in 1939 or 40 in L.A. at the Chesterfield program, Cigarettes with Glenn Miller, and I went and introduced myself to him, and that was 39 or 40. By 43, we met in New York. He was still with Glenn Miller, and I was with uh, T-Guard. So it's very interesting. I mean, you know, 
In Spanish, we have a saying, el que quiere, puede. If you want to, you can. If you want to be a lawyer, you study law. If you want to be a doctor, you study medicine. If you want to be a musician, you study music. It's simple as all that. Everybody's born with talent. God doesn't make anybody anything. You can pray to God all your life to make you something. He's too busy. You see a lot of people. But if you want to, all you have to do is study. And you get there. That's my philosophy anyway. Now, what about the, the other Chicano musician? What did he play? Ernie Figueroa is also from El Paso, a trumpet player. Great, great. And Ernie Cáceres was a baritonist. Have they both passed away as far as you know? Uh, Ernie Cáceres is gone. Ernie Figueroa, I think, lives up north somewhere in San Francisco or Oakland. But I think they're, yeah. Don't forget, I'm 75 years old. I'm five years younger than you're dead, man. And like I say, the big bands, you have to read, and you had to play, and you had to play better than the little white kids. I'm sure. Because you were brown, they yeah, didn't that's right. play. You had to play circles around. Yeah. yeah. Name some of the musicians that you played with during those years who later became very famous or were particularly well, great. Played people you played with, people you knew or met. I think I've worked with everybody Bud Shank, Art Pepper, uh, Clark Terry. Ah, uh, my God. Doc Severinsen. Yes. Doc Severinsen. This is in the picture I showed you. And I did bring that picture on the symphony program because it's very easy to brag. But when you have pictures to back what you say, well then. Yeah, exactly. Been there, done that. And if you're a beautiful woman, a lovely woman, you don't have to tell anybody how many beauty contests you want. They just look at you and you're beautiful. It's the ordinary looking woman that tells you she was Miss Texas of 1989. And you look at her and say, and says, my God, if she was Miss Texas of 1989, I wonder what the other dogs look like. <laughs> In other words, you know, like talent, ability shows through. You don't have to speak about it, it's there. And if people don't appreciate it or don't know about it, well, as the Jewish say, a big zoom, so let it be. The only thing that you can do with your life is I have been there and I've done that. I mean, for a little Mexican kid who was 23 years old to have Jimmy Dorsey as his best man at his wedding. Wow. Oh, yeah. I got pictures. We love to Tijuana. We were appearing at a ballroom named Pacific Square Ballroom in San Diego. And Bertita came from L.A. with my friend Carlos Torres, who's going to be my best man. So when Verdita told Jimmy Dorsey we're getting married, Jimmy says, well, I'm the best man. So he was. Wow. He offered it. Yeah. In 48. Well, he loved the Hispanic world because, you know, he had gotten very famous with Green Eyes and Maria Elena and Tangerine. Yeah. Anyway, he loved the people and he made a lot of money. And he was a beautiful man. Beautiful man. Did you ever meet uh, Tommy? Yes, I did. I met him. I never worked for him. But he was a little stronger man, you know. They were brothers, but one was a strong character and the other one was just humble, docile, and sweet. And that's, that's the way life is, you know, even in brothers and sisters and the whole thing. Uh, what about, I remember you mentioned to me once before about uh, the, you met or people like Miles Davis, some of those people. Oh yeah, well, at 52nd Street, New York, you know, we knew each other, and uh, we became very big later. But uh, the drugs. Those are those early bebop guys. Yes. Oh, when they oh yes, starting yes. Up. Yeah. Well, I knew Charlie Parker. I knew. Really? Oh yeah, I knew Charlie Parker. I, Roy Eldridge, Charlie Shavers, Dizzy Gillespie. Did you ever see Charlie Parker play? So? Oh yeah, I that, I used to see him. As a matter of fact, that sometimes I used to see him over there in East LA on Sixth Street by the Greyhound Station. Really? Walking around with his plastic saxophone out of his mind from driving. Oh, really? Well, remember he ended up in, uh, what was the name of that uh, institution? Uh, wow. California? Yeah. Camarillo? Camarillo. That's where he ended up through his drugs. He was a gifted young man. He died very young, you know. Oh, yeah. And then we had great bass players, Black, Charlie Mingus, Red Colander, 
We were all friends. You know. Who was that guy that you, you mentioned? I remember you told me a story once uh, about some, I think he was a black bass player who, who taught you about tapping your foot left to right. Oh, Milton Hinton. Yeah, <laughs> I met him in 1943. I think I was with, I was at the Sherman, college in at the Sherman Hotel and uh, I was playing, I, I don't know, I think it was Tea Garden or Sherwood and this guy comes up to me and wanted to know where I had learned how to play the bass the way I was doing it. Oh, I says, well, I studied with a German man from the symphony, Arthur Pest in L.A. And the book is the Mundel, Francie Mundel is Bible of Book Playing. So he offered to buy me a drink. So I went with him for the free drink. <laughs> so I wrote the name of the book and then I asked him, I finally asked him what his name was and he says, Milton Hinton. I said, oh my God, you're the bass player with Cap Calloway? He says, yeah, you know who I am? I said, definitely, I followed your, your career because I love bass players. And he's the guy who told me to walk and not step on every beat. One, not one, two, three, four, but left, right, left, right. It's walking. No musicians do that now. But he made me aware of it. And it makes you kind of swing more? Yeah, because you have balance. How, how fast can you tap your foot when music is fast? But if you go half time, then you can walk, you see. That's Milton Hinton, yeah. Amazing. So what, what uh, this is just a thought that occurred to me. What? What was the thing that... You know, you did all those big bands. Yeah. And where was it that it switched over from you being in the big bands into the next period, which was more of the, the Latin groups? And the 1948, when I met my father. When the son of a gun wasn't too proud of me, he thought I should be a composer and a band leader. So that's when I started writing. And with my knowledge of harmony and arranging... That was a nice gift he gave you, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. He was a motivator. And then you performed your own orchestra? Yeah. And what was After that? After Pachuca Boogie, well, in L.A. And was that called the Don Tosti? Yeah, Don Tosti. Of course, I'd had orchestras in high school, you know, but I was just a kid. And then you, is, you switched over from the, the big band type music into more Latin? That's totally right. Totally Latin. That's right. And I studied Latin music. I studied the clave, the form, because I didn't know it. I'm Latin. Wow. At that point, you didn't know it? No. Wow. The mere fact that you're Latin doesn't mean right. that you know Latin music. Right. Right. No and way. you learned all the styles. Oh yeah, the clave. What you call the clave. Right. Right. And you write with the clave. And I did that. There was a bass player named Tony Reyes who was great. He's in heaven now. I called him for lessons, but he wouldn't teach me. So I, I had to study from recordings. I have to, you know, copy the patterns from records. And luckily, do you think did he not teach you because he didn't have the time or desire? Or do you think there was a competitor? No, he thought uh, his reply when I asked him for lessons was, "What can I teach the great Don Tosti?" Because oh. I was a jazz player. When I was, you know, I was renowned, and he, what the hell can I teach Tosti? So I said Latin. I said no, too busy. So. I couldn't find a teacher to teach me Latin. I copied records and wrote, wrote the patterns. So I learned. Well, did your first band uh, have a vocalist, or did you play mainly instrumentals? No, the first band that I ever had was, I, there was a singer named Ray Boskis, who was a trombonist. He played with my high school band. Art Pepper was in my high school band. Joe Felix, the great jazz pianist, was in my high school band. My girl singer was Norma, Nancy Norman, a Jewish girl who later ended up with Kay Kaiser. And there was a, an older Mexican bass player that I loved named Carlos Guerrero. He's in heaven now. Uh, yeah, good one. He, uh, when you say high school band, are you talking about the high school yeah. orchestra or are you talking about the band you had when you were in high school? Well, I led the school, I led the school bands and I wrote for them. But then we were so good they hired us. You know, for the social dances. We only used to get $2 a night then. Make you well, what, what was that group you had with Eddie Cano? You had a separate little trio? Was it was a quartet. School? No, that what was, was that? After, that was in 48. That was later on. Yeah, when my father asked me to write, and I wrote about Pachuca Boogie. And that's when you had Eddie yes, Cano? Yes, right. And you had gone to high school with him? No. How would you know Eddie Cano? No, I, Eddie Cano went to Lincoln. I graduated from high school in 41. 
Americano, he went to Lincoln. He graduated about 44 or 45. He's, he was about five years younger than me. And he used to play with an orchestra named Easy Czar from the time he was a teenager. Lincoln High School had uh, Eric Cano and another Mexican great musician named Robin Leon. He's a doctor of music now. He's also from El Paso. He's a pianist, a saxophonist, and a great arranger, orchestrator. But you don't hear about some of these people, and they're gifted. That I mean, as far as I'm concerned, you know, like they're my idols, or they're my contemporaries. We study. You know. Some of us have gotten lucky. Some of us have not. I keep telling everybody that I know at least ten arrangers that are better than Henry Mancini, Hank Mancini, <laughs> but they just don't become well known. There's only one Hank Mancini. And you know, not to be a cop out, but part yeah. of it is the discrimination too, would you say? In, in the job opportunities? Well, there was, sure it is. It still exists, not as prevalent. But uh, again, you had to develop yourself and now do your contemporaries, you know. And they gave you a job. I did well. I worked with the big band. So, Didn't matter. So now getting back into the, the 50s, now in the 50s, you had your big heyday with your own orchestra. Yeah. And during that whole Desi Arnaz era and all the Latin bands were very in vogue. And the, what was in at the time, like the sambas and the rumbas? Well, that was more commercial. It was the boleros, the mambo, the cha-cha. Right. And, yeah. and you had Javier Cugat. And well, the Cugat was uh, a commercial band. Mm-hmm. The real Latin bands then copied Cugat. Right, he was, was cornball. He wasn't even that talented. Really. Well, he was, he was a good businessman. Yeah. You know, the, the people we copied were Machito, or Tito Puente, Jose Curbelo, New Yorkers, Puerto Ricans. And a lot of them were Cubans, yeah. Puerto Ricans, Africans. Well, it's their music. Right. You know, they can't play mariachi music either, but they don't want to. That's right. Okay. <laughs> so we copy yeah. them. You have to have an idol, you know. Yeah. Like in jazz, you know, I'm Mexican, and then I became one of the fine jazz bass players in the world. Why? Because I love jazz, and I researched it, dissected it, and studied it. And I'm Mexican. Now here I am. I don't play corridos. There's all kinds of Mexicans. There's the ones who write the burros, and there's the ones who don't. It's amazing to each his own. Is you know that saying we have? Cada chango con su mecate. Each monkey with his own vine hangs from their own vine. <laughs> like so to each his own, man. So what about uh, Perez Prado? What was he? Was he respected? Very. Yeah, he was respected and commercial. He was very successful. He was a good friend, too. I met him in Mexico. Yeah. He became, uh, you see, Prado became like uh, his mambo was really a commercial mambo, but it was good. Now, to me, we were friends, and I admire him and how much money he's made and how famous he got. But he'll never replace Tito Puente in my conception of Latin music. Did Pérez Prado play an instrument? Yeah, he's a pianist. He's good? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And he wrote well. He's a good arranger. What about people's, I mean, these are just some names that are coming to mind. Yeah. Well, like, say, René Tuzet. Was he Excellent. Latino? Was he Latino? Yeah, was he? Cubano. No, he was. Anglo-looking. His, his name sounds French. He had descendancy French. Oh. But he was a blonde-looking blonde, blonde looking Cuban. And he had a great band. He had a great band. He was a great arranger. So you were saying that René Tuzet was a great musician yes. and a good person. Beautiful person. Beautiful. And what, what about, I mean, this might be getting way later, but people like, again, I think he was not Latino, like Cal Jader. Oh, did, did gifted, of, yes. Did a lot of Latin. That's right. Not, again, he dedicated himself to learning the clave. Well, Concha Sanchez was his right. conguero. Right. And then he had three brothers, Los Hermanos Duran from Oakland, Manny Duran, the bass player, the, uh, the piano player. Again, may I express myself? If you want to be a doctor, you study medicine. If you want to be a good Latin piano player or a good musician, you have to study Latin music, the clave. Not Mexican music, not cumbia, not Band. ordinary. You study the source. And that's what happens. You know, and all that stuff you're talking about, I mean, the, the clave and the, the uh, Cuban Puerto Rican has that black African element to it. It's Afro Cuban, it's Latin and, and black mixed together. Uh, what happens there, 
is that the basic music was heard by school musicians who then made a theory out of it. As you probably know now, our universities, especially UCLA and USC, are teaching mariachi music. Where before they played by ear and not a tune. Now they're school musicians because it's, it's becoming an art. So that's what happened with the black Afro-Cuban music that was basic. Then came the fine school musicians it who made naturally. the thesis. Same thing with like the Louis Armstrongs. It just the early Dixieland. It came out of the streets, and then they turned it into a school musician. Well, then he was like the father. He was like the basic man. But then you have guys like Charlie Chavers and Roy Aldrich. Now this young man, Wynton Marsalis. Yeah, they study. They aren't born. They study. They develop the art, and that's what we're speaking about. You know. And like I say, like, like Renette to say, was a very skilled musician. Very, very skilled. He was an arranger, a composer. And uh, Clark Terry was a gifted man. He is a gifted man. He's still alive. He's a friend of mine. And, but this is a jazz. This is a jazz of about 50 years ago. 50, 60 years ago. Wow. And hey, getting back to your Pachuco Boogie song, yeah. uh, what triggered that idea to do that? Uh, commercialism. You figured it would go over. Yeah, like I, I had been a jazz musician, so like uh, we took a boogie form, which is a 12 bar blues, which the rock now is right. the basis for so rock. It's like pre rock. And uh, being, I was from El Paso, you know, so I wrote some lyrics and some melodic line. Then I wrote, uh, now in El Paso, we don't call it calo, it's pachuco talk. Nele se vato, si no voy vengo del paciente se. That's the way we talk, have talk, you know, Paso. And I was from there, so that was me. That was one of the first rap songs ever. And that inspired other people to write. And um, so anyway, it sold well around the Southwest or what? Oh, it sold, it sold very, very well. That, that was a big, big hit on Tosco Records. Did you follow it up with other similar Yeah, things? I wrote other things. That, uh, they did well. Uh, what the hell did I write after that? A song called Wisagacha. I wrote a thing called Las Ruedas de la Nana. I wrote another thing called El Tirili. Nunca he visto un tirili. Nunca he visto un tirili. Son los vatos que se ponen butijay. Luego, luego quieren fight. Luego, luego quieren fight. Pero no le pegue que es un tirili. What is a tirili? A tirili is a pachuco, a shaky, a druggy. Ah. They thought they want to fight, you know, when they get high. So it's just nothing, really nothing. It's just commercialism. It's sold. I made money. Did you? I like the girls. I like new cars. So like I enjoyed it. <laughs> so did you, uh, did you venture much more into what you would call pre-rock in terms of blues, boogie woogie, uh, things swing, things that, that later evolved into rock? Did you play much of that or write much of that? Well, no. I what I did, I did do jazz things about as far as close to rock as I got was the boogie right that's about it okay. and uh, rock is a different field that came in much later much later than, than the 40s and the late 40s but those were the seeds I mean it came out of all those things um, but uh, you know music is related jazz blues rock como es una secuencia it's a sequence right. you know and then uh it develops. And then look at now, it's a rap market. The guys with the braids and, uh, and uh, <laughs> kill each other and all that. Like gangster rap. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, it's called marketing. Right. So They want to sell records. They want to make money. So like now, you had, a, you had a TV show, right, in the 50s. Yeah. What was the story on that? On that well, there was a, a guy named Eddie Rodriguez. He was a radio announcer who... That it didn't spoke the beautiful Spanish, you know, like the other radio announcers that we had. He was kind of a pocho, half Spanish, half English, half right, half wrong. <laughs> and uh, he, he got a sponsor, Bulldog Lager Beer. And he wanted a show and he hired me. How long did that run? Oh, quite a while. I think it was 39 weeks, three seasons. And you, you had your uh, orchestra that played. Did you yeah. have guest musical artists? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And you have dancers on dancing on, on the set or no dancers? Uh, some. 
Very little. Very little. It was mostly music. What kind of guests did you have? Anybody of note? Well, no, no. At the time, it was all uh, Latin. Blanca del Mar. And then I hired a girl named Gloria Becker. Oh, yeah. Gloria Sanchez. They did the ranchero stuff on my program. Because I didn't do that. I did Latin. And were you like the MC as well? You just talk? Uh, I, I was, yeah. I would speak. No, Eddie Rodriguez was the MC. I was the orchestra leader, but I was interviewed, yeah. And I was, it was my orchestra. Was my did, did you ever meet uh, Desi Arnaz? Yeah. Yes, I did. She didn't play with him? Oh, no. Oh, no, no. No, he's, a, he's another gentleman like Prado, a very successful gentleman of Latin music. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> I know. Uh, he he couldn't play the congas, he couldn't sing, <laughs> he couldn't act, but he's... He was he's, more like Cougat of Dr. Uh, thank you. That's yes, sir. That kind of a guy. That type a hustler, of hustler. Uh, yep. And he knew how to do it. He, he's, he became a very wealthy man. Right. He's, he's, you know, like Lucy. And, uh, but I mean, you know, like I married a, a redhead, you know, you knew her, Ruthie, and uh, she used to call me Desi, and a lot of people call me Desi, and I said, don't call me Desi. Why did they it was do that? flattering oh. because I resembled him a little, and right. and my wife was a redhead, and oh, he's I, why, see. Yeah, that, I said, don't call me you that. Wore those big ruffle shirts. Yeah, I said, don't call me that. And I said, why, why, why? I said, well, I'm toasty. Know. Yeah, I'm a musician. <laughs> This gentleman is a showman. That's true. Like my father. My father was a showman, a go-getter. He would sell you the Brooklyn Bridge, you know. Yeah. And this, this is not what I was. I was right. a musician. I'm not, a, right. I'm not an entertainer. I'm right. a musician. And what, what about um, uh, Chico Sesma? Did you know him? Very well. What's we went to high school together. Was, was he a good uh, musician? Yes. And he played with some big bands. Tremonist. He worked with Johnny Richards. That was the biggest band that he worked with. And we all worked around town in L.A. with Sal Cervantes, De La Torre, Cesar. And uh, he's a pocho. He speaks very little, very, oh, really? yeah, very little Spanish. Now, later he became a radio personality. That's right. Did he's he well-spoken. Just, just English? Or? Just English. Oh, really? Very little Spanish. And he became a big promoter. That's right. Latin holiday at the Palladium. He became very wealthy. Did you ever play there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I graduated in summer 41 from Roseville High School. He graduated in summer 42, the next term. And we became friends, and I love him because he's one of the Mexicans that I admire the most in this world. He's very educated, very educated. I sent him a postcard one day that saying that I, there are three Mexicans that I admire in this world. Chico Sesma, Rubén León, and Eddie Cano, musically, not personally, musically. And Chico Sesma was not a jazz player. He was what we call a technician. A technician is a musician who can read and play anything, but he can't play anything by ear. Mantienes? He can't improvise. There was a, with the Johnny Carson show, the lead man, a little guy, Italian guy named Gianni Audino, who became the greatest lead trumpet player in the world. And he couldn't play Stardust if it wasn't written. So those are technicians, like a symphony orchestra player who only plays what he reads, can't play anything by ear or by heart. It's amazing, huh? Yeah, improvising. Yeah. Do you know that we have surgeons in the medical field that if your loved one doesn't bleed like the manual, like the book says, they'll yeah. die. Yeah. They can't improvise. That musicians, some musicians are like that. Give me a jazz surgeon any day. So you're going to improvise? I so hope I'm not being outspoken. No, no, it's great. That's what I want. All right. So then uh, you uh, you moved out here to Palm Springs way early, huh? So oh, yeah. 61 or 2? Or well, I started working around here in 59, 58. I used to come for the season. And then I used to go back home. And in 60, I, I, I spent in Honolulu at the Hawaiian Village Hotel. I was there all year. And then I came back to work here at the Harvard Manor Hotel, and I met the Redhead. So it was that year. I, she didn't want to live in L.A., so I had to buy her the home that I live in now. 61. I'm still there. And then, and then, you know, then Lalo came. 
Manny Lopez has moved, Gloria Becker moved, you know. I came out here now because it was Paul Space, because I liked the redhead. You know? <laughs> so the, the, the things went well. I did very well in the country club circuit. You know, I, I went from a jazz musician to a Latin musician to a society musician. And then when did you take up piano in earnest? I mean, you, lately you played piano. Music. Yeah, I play piano. I always could play piano for keyboard harmony. But then uh, after I met the redhead, I was, I had to band at the Kenyon Hotel, which was the number one. It's now closed. I don't remember the years, but I was at the Les Copier in the dining room, and I was still playing bass. And supposedly I was one of the finest bass players around. And I had a lady piano player. And after the third year that she worked for me, she was making more money than I was. Because mm. every now and then she'd come to me and say, Tosi, I... I got offered a job, more money, and I had to have a piano player. And uh, she was well, she was a good piano player. She was not exceptional, but she was good. So one day I went home to the Red, and I said, baby, what in the world is going on? From one to 10, I'm a 12 bass player. My pianist from one to 10 is like a four and a half piano player, and she's making more money than I am. And it's my band and my job for three years. You know what the Redhead did? She smiled. He says, well, baby, learn how to play the lead. Learn how to play the melody. So I bought an organ and I studied keyboards. So for the last, I don't know how many years, I play keyboards, but I'm not a pianist. You do pretty damn well. I well, guess. but I'm not one. I went to hear uh, Herb Jeffers the other day at this new place called Destiny Z, and they had a, an Anglo gentleman, Cal somebody from L.A., he scared the pie out of me. And this <laughs> lovely lady who was having dinner with me says, oh, I told her, that that pianist is, is a monster. And says, well, I've heard you play, and you play just as well as he does. I says, wait a minute, dear, please. Thank you for the compliment. <laughs> She's a pianist. I'm a piano player. There is a difference. And, and you put down the bass, and you haven't played it for I haven't played 20 it. years? Or what? Oh, well, I know, 37 years. Do you miss it at all? Yeah, I love it. But uh, again, you know, again, the love of survival. I was a fine bass player, but my piano player was making more money than I was. So I'm a survivor. I love the good things in life. And you took up singing when you started singing. Then I started, you know, I, I've told you, Mel Torme is a velvet fog, Don Tosti is a ruptured frog. And Mike Carrero's what? What? Mark Guerrero, what do no, we call him? That, oh, no, no. You're the toad, yeah. The, oh, the horny toad? Yeah, horny toad. <laughs> I, I just thought of that. <laughs> yeah, so like, you know, uh, and now I teach voice. And I have professionals who come to me to learn to read and voice and reading. I'm not a singer. You, you understand? You teach piano as well, right? Yeah, I teach bass, piano, and guitar, and voice. And the, the, the analogy that I give everybody, I'm not a singer, but I'm a voice teacher. I have researched it and I've studied it. Angelo Dandi was a little Italian who was the brains of Muhammad Ali. He couldn't fight. He was too small, but he was the brains. Again, el que quiere puede. If you study, if you research, if you gain the knowledge, you can do it. So now, and, and my whole idea at my age is that uh, by the end of this year, I should have 30 pupils. And that's what I love to do. I love to teach. Now, is that is that cut down from more, or is that higher than ever? What, no, I'm moving up to 30. I have about 30 now. 13? Yeah. I've studied a lot, and I have no kids of my own. My wife never had any kids, so... I studied a book by a man named Stephen Covey. And what impressed me, he opens his book with four L's, to live to love, to learn, and to live a legacy. Mm -hmm. And my teaching is to live a legacy. Isn't that it. beautiful? To live, you got to live like your home, beautiful, the whole thing. To love, you got to have that. To learn, never stop learning. Like I practice every day. And to live a legacy. Now my library, my, my musical library, I'm going to leave the College of the Desert. That's what Charlie Barnett did with his. 
And whatever little money, you know, that, that my little chihuahua doesn't inherit, I'll give it to some kind of a Mexican society for the development of young Mexican musicians. Scholarships or something? That's right, because I don't have any kids, you know. Great. And I have uh, accumulated, uh, I have savings of $300. $300? Yes. Wow. <laughs> so that'll buy some lessons. Three bucks. <laughs> You're doing quite well in New York. So, anything else you'd like to add? I think that's pretty much the basic, well, basic story. Well, thank you. No, I'm a very happy man, and I love to teach. And again, to my people and my kids, and to all races, but being of Mexican descent, I love them. El que quiere, puede. If you want to, you can. Lo que va, viene. What goes around, comes around. Siempre ayuda, but que Dios te perdone si necesitas ayuda. Always be of help to everybody, but God forgive you if you need help. Little phrases, and that's the way I live. And but remember where I brought you that memorization uh, things for June, exercises for June and May. I do it for my kids. Oh, and thank you for flattering me of giving me the interview. And should you need any more information, I'm available. Great. I've been wanting to do this for years, as Great. you know. It's, it's important for And it's like I say, yeah. Uh, again, I mentioned uh, of the, there's an er Ernesto Figueroa, or any Figueroa trumpet player from El Paso, Ernesto Casares with Glenn Miller. And then with, with, uh, there was an older man who played trombone with T Garden named Jake Flores. Now, in, year, in later years, we had like Bill Trujillo. There's some very dad, young. He played with my dad. All right. But this was, they played with the. Ella Fitzgerald. Well, yeah, and they played with the Glenn Miller band, with the band, you know, the, not with the original. It, it was oh, yeah, like after. now, yeah, after. Now you have the, right. the Jimmy Dorsey band. You got the Les Harry James band. Yeah, yeah. Well, Les Brown's still alive. Is so he still alive? Oh, yeah. He's still fronty. He's a good businessman. He's a good mm -hmm. businessman. Very successful. Now he's not he's not a musician in the class of uh, T Garden or Bobby Sherwood or Jimmy Dorsey or Tommy Dorsey. He's not in that class at all. But he's a very fine businessman. And he's in the swing just field. He's more or less like Lawrence Welk. <laughs> like uh Kugat, the commercial marketing businessman that were wise. Semi K made a lot of money. And then you have to die hard musician. Now we have your breed, your generation. Look at the book. It's beautiful. And that's why I'm going to go buy the book and read it so that I know, become, you know, I want to be aware of that too. Right? Yeah. The beat goes on. The beat goes on. What have I got? I'm 75. Probably going to heaven soon. You know. And thank you for the interview. I mean, it's. Thank you. It's my how, pleasure to, you know, publicize it in your, your life. You know. All right. All right, man. I can go home now? You may go. Gracias. You're free. <laughs> See you later next time. Okay.